Welcome to um, this panel for Nano Day at Penn 2023. Um, this Nano Day at Penn is an annual event and um, we welcome lots of participation every year. So there are sessions where people will come into the classroom and we'll make sure you get on a mailing list if you're interested in that. So, sorry, I'm having, oh, I'm letting someone in right now. Okay, and so what I wanted to mention though, this is part of Nano, um, Nano National Nano Day, which was actually Monday is the actual day. And there is a contest that the National Nanotechnology Coordinator in uh, Coordinated Infrastructure runs, which um, has images from various nanotechnology facilities. And everybody is invited to look at those images and to vote on their favorite images. So the University of Pennsylvania, which has one of the sites and facilities here, um, has a couple images in there, but there are images from all 16 sites around the country. So you're welcome to take a look. Everyone is welcome to vote. It is all public um, public excitement about nanotechnology. And you can learn a little bit about nanotechnology imaging and research um, topics through this image contest. So the, um, the URL is also in the chat, but you can scan that, the, the uh, QR code to get to that web page. Um, so the next, I just wanted to quickly talk about what a PhD is. And so that's a degree called a doctor of philosophy that is different than a doctor of medicine. So an MD, which you often think of um, those people on the, uh, the top of the screen, the ones with stethoscopes and wearing scrubs, those are MDs generally. Um, PhDs, doctor of philosophies, are another type of advanced degree that allow people to become professors and teach um, at universities and to teach different uh, college classes. They also allow, PhDs allow people to do research, both at universities and in industry and in other settings. So in companies that do research, biomedical companies, engineering companies, um, PhDs can have PhDs in, um, in, computer coding, so they could never enter a laboratory, but they could be working on code on their computers in both an office setting, but also a laboratory setting. And it also allows people to manage research and manage people who have, are doing research. And so that's what PhDs do. All right, so how do you get to a PhD? Sorry for the interruption there. But anyway, once you have your high school diploma, then typically you would do an undergraduate degree. And so that might mean going to a community college and getting an associate's degree or going to a four-year college um, or university and getting a bachelor's degree. And so bachelor's degrees can be BAs, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Science and Engineering. Um, and then you are ready to go to graduate school usually. And so graduate school, usually is either a master's degree, um, which will take two to three years, can be a master's in arts, master's of science, or a master's of engineering, for example. Um, and then there's the uh, doctor of philosophy degree, so the PhD. And that usually takes people four to six years. Um, you And when you have graduated, you get a PhD. And both of those graduate degrees allow for advanced study, and or career preparation in a specific topic or area. And so today um, we are concentrating on students who are working on their PhDs. Um, and they're going to talk about their work as part of their PhD program. Um, and these are all students who are in our School of Engineering and they're gonna talk about how their work also relates to nanotechnology and on the nanoscale. And so three of the students are in the same lab group. And then one student, Aria, will go first and introduce both sort of the general areas they're in and then talk a little bit about what she does and about her, her interests and career path. Okay, Aria? So, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Aria. I'm a PhD student uh, studying material science at UPenn. Um, so when I tell people, 
that I my major is material science. I often get this question: What exactly do you do? So today I'll start start my presentation answering that question here. So material science scientist, as you can probably tell by its name, we study materials. We discover new materials and we improve existing materials. So at the top we have the structure. It can be the arrangement of like atoms and molecules. Um, the different structures determines different properties the materials can have. Um, does it conducting heat? Um, is it tough, um, et cetera? And properties can uh, decide how well specific uh, materials can perform uh, for specific applications. And at the left corner, we have the processing. So we use different processing methods and conditions to make different materials. And the processing can determine the structure and consequently uh, change the properties and performance of the material. So material scientist studies the relationship between the four corners of the tetrahedron. And in doing so, uh, to do so, we use different characteri characterization methods. So for example, if we would like to characterize the structure, uh, we would use, uh, we can use microscope, the very, very expensive ones, so that we can see, we can actually see the atoms and molecules and their arrangements. Um, that's one, that's an example of the characterization. And there are six different classes of the materials. We have metals, ceramics, and biomaterials. One example would be like the implant and stents um, in, the in the medicine field. We have semiconductors, which is very important for your for the electron electronic devices that you use. And we have composites and polymers, and uh, uh, which is the area that I'm working on. Uh, next slide. So um, the specific materials that I'm working on is called polymer nanocomposites. Um, so we have the polymers here, the soft like spaghetti-like polymers, and we have hard <clears throat> inorganic uh, particles, uh, which are nanoscale. That's why we the material is called nanocomposites. And the combination of the soft polymer and the hard nanoparticles form uh, polymer nanocomposites, and it can allow many different, many enhanced properties and provide solutions to many applications, such as the packaging, food packaging, consumer good packaging, and batteries and uh, uh, automobile. Um, it can also have provide solutions for medical applications and also provide uh, constructing construction materials. Next slide. So my project specifically studies how different processing parameters affect the structure. So uh, here is a cartoon showing my uh, the sample that I make in the lab. It's a film. Um, so the blue area is the polymer and the orange dots represent the particles. So I'm studying um, uh, two different parameters. One is the film thickness, and two is the processing time. In this case, the heating time. Um, how those two parameters affect the event, the final structures of the material. So I first make the samples and I characterize the structure. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the example of uh, the top, the surface of the film that I make. Um, you can see here the uh, the bright dots here at the bottom image is the nanoparticles. They're very, very small. The diameter of the bright spot is approximately like one thousandth of the uh, diameter of your hair. So they're very small. Um, and we can see them like different nanoparticles. So the bright, sp bright spots are the particles and the darker regions um, are the polymers. Next. Yeah, so after we heat the film, the sample, um, the surface would have 
different arrangements of the nanoparticles. You can see like one hour and 24 hour heating have very different structures. Um, next. So the, um, if after we change the film thickness, the, the structure looks also very different. Um, it's more complicated. We can see the patchy, like a large uh, area of the particles and large area of the polymer. So we can imagine this different, uh, per, different surface uh, structures would affect the, um, the properties of the materials. So we know the material structures. What's next? Um, the next step would be to characterize the properties. Um, such as the mechanical properties, like how tough the material is, um, how flexible, how tensile the material is. Mm. There are also a lot of card like animations on this slide. Yeah. So after um, my next step for the project would be to study the properties. And further down the line, um, once we have the properties, we would um, test the performance for specific applications. So after that, uh, we decide if the performance is good or not, uh, and we change the processing method. So this uh, loop is um, the like what material scientists do. Some of us do like process focus on processing and characterizing structures. Some of us focus on the performance, like or application oriented uh, research, but like. This is what material science, like our research would include. Okay. And so now we're gonna go to the Winey Lab group, which are the three grad students um, that um, were introduced at the beginning. So Maggie, Ben, and Kate. Um, Hi. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, thank you for always giving a brief intro to materials science engineering. I am a materials engineer from Rutgers, uh, uh, State University of New Jersey, and I want to give a little bit of background of how I ended up in a PhD. So on the left here, this is a picture of me melting some glass, which gives a very good example of like what a materials engineer does. Um, we, we make materials, so an example of that would be melting glass. Uh, we also do something called 3D printing, which you might have heard about, where we print things in a in like a spiral shape that can make objects like this chess piece that I had here that I made for fun because uh, I like chess. <laughs> and then um, in 2018, 2019, so I'm pretty old now, I'm 25, um, I decided to do a PhD and this is a picture of me on the Penn campus. So next slide, please. So I already briefly mentioned this, but um, polymers are these nano-sized molecules that are made of many monomers. and you may be familiar with something called like a polygon. So poly means many. And um, so a polygon has many sides and a polymer has many mers. And so here in the middle, you can see this chain here with the black and white dots. This is like a representation of a molecule and a polymer is just when you have many of these little molecules chained together. And that's what Aria was talking about was like a spaghetti. So you make like one big spaghetti by chaining together a lot of these particles and then on the right here, that little squiggly thing that looks like a meatball, um, that's what like what happens when you get a lot of polymers together. So they get all tang tangled up and they make this like large thing. And a lot of polymers, um, you can fill them with things. You can put things in between the chains, like called nanoparticles. So here's like a human hair picture on the bottom right. So a human hair is this big underneath a microscope. If you have one microparticle, this is like the size of how human hair. So the nanoparticles that Ari are talking about is on the far right. That's how many dots are filled in one human hair. So nanoparticles are really, really, really small. And what a nanocomposite is, is just when you add polymers and nanoparticles to anything. So you can add anything. They even put literally anything to it. And that's a nanocomposite now. So next slide, please. So polymers and nanocomposites are really everywhere. And they don't have to be. Um, the, the classic example is plastic. So anything plastic you have is a polymer. Um, you can have nylon. A lot of your clothes are polyester. You can have Teflon, which is on your pans to make them nonstick. 
but they also have natural nano natural um, polymers like DNA is a polymer, rubber, clothing, wool, cellulose, which is like the stuff that's in trees. And they have a lot of applications like 3D printing. Um, all of your tires are also nanocomposites. They're the most famous nanocomposite. And what they're made of is just a bunch of those polymers stacked together and then you put them into the shape of a tire with these black nanoparticles inside and that's why they're all black shaped. Um, but there's a lot of applications for this. So on the next slide, um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of overview of what I do with my research. So I research polymers for carbon capture um, and I characterize them and find out their applications using an ion beam, which my friend Ben will talk about in a few slides. So the idea here is that um, any kind of industrial process will make a lot of carbon dioxide and pollution into our air. And with a polymer, which is like a plastic film, I'm trying to capture the carbon dioxide and make it from, and prevent it from getting into the atmosphere. And this is like a collaboration with the National Institute of Standards Technology, like NIST in Maryland. And what happens is you make like this honeycomb beehive structure, and then you have like the polymer in the tubes uh, in between each one. And then so if you push the air through the tubes, we wanna see how much carbon dioxide we're trapping. And um, you can see here, I used the ion beam and the ion beam can measure um, where the carbon dioxide is in the films. So if you don't see any of the uh, bright yellow here in the picture on the bottom right, the bright yellow is where I'm trapping carbon dioxide and the blue is when there is no carbon dioxide. So I can test these different materials and see if there is carbon capture or no carbon capture. And this is gonna really help us see if these materials are working. And if it's not working, we're gonna try something new. Um, next slide, please. So that's what I do on a daily basis. Um, I also wanted to just give you an overview of the PhD, which is, it's been a really great opportunity for me to learn about myself and see it from about the world. So you get to try a lot of things in the PhD. All these experiments, it may seem like very straightforward, but what ends up happening is you try something and it doesn't work, and then you have to try something else. And um, you get a lot of confidence from knowing, like, I know how to solve things because I've tried a lot of things and... Um, you also get to travel to things like conferences. So there's, on the left, I went to Vegas for a physics conference, which is a really funny thing to do. And then I've also gone to like the NASA Space Center and got to see like a lot of the engineering there when I was in my undergrad. And um, I would just end with saying like, don't underestimate yourself if you're really interested in science. I was never particularly good at science in high school. So here I am anyway, <laughs> don't know how that happened. I got like one of the lowest grades in my class one time. So um, if you have any interest in engineering, I would consider going for it. And then I'll leave it off with Maggie. Um, so hi, I'm Maggie. Uh, so I am a second year PhD student. So I've not been here for anywhere near as long as Kate, but I'm um, still gonna introduce myself and give some overview of my research and also just what got me into um, materials and looking at the nanoscale. So I come from Penn State where I did material science research. And um, you can see on the bottom some of the work that my group did. Um, so it's not always that fun, but what I do like about materials is that you get a chance to, you know, make cool pictures, make things glow. Um, and that's my cat on the top left, who's not relevant, but I like to show her off. <laughs> Next slide. So I just wanted to talk about first, um, kind of what, you can use to think about my research and also this is kind of what got me into the research in the first place because you know people talk about nanomaterials nanoparticles and i think uh, how how did we know about these how do we understand these how do we make them um because they're just you know they're so small um and i think this is a really cool analogy um so my materials are um polymers like kate's and um they do something called phase separation. And so on the left, you can see lava lamps. And for those of you who don't know how lava lamps work, there's basically um, the liquid that's taking up most of the space is water. And then those bubbles are made of wax. And, you know, we know from salad dressing, you know, oil or wax doesn't mix with water. So what happens is it 
kind of aggregates, it likes to stick to itself and it forms these little bubbles which float around. And if you go down to the tiny, tiny nanoscale, uh, polymers do the exact same thing. So my polymers have two blocks. So the left side, you can see where it says A is one block. You can picture that being like water and the right block is B. You can consider that to be like wax and oil. And when you look on that small of a scale, the polymers do the same thing as salad dressing or lava lamps where the B blocks all stick together and the A blocks all stick together. And since they have these fixed lengths, they end up forming really cool shapes. And you can control those shapes by controlling the size of the blocks. And um, you can see they make spheres, cylinders, this very cool gyroid shape and layers. And you can actually look at these using x-rays, almost like you'd look at a bone, but with more math. Um, next slide. So like I said, um, my research works on these, but uh, the applications I think are really cool too. Um, my materials are designed to be applicable to batteries. So if you look in a battery, um, I think most people have a sense that there's something called battery acid there. In material science, we call that the electrolyte. And that transports these things called lithium ions in the battery. And the idea is that as the lithium travels through the battery, that produces the electricity. So normally uh, these are made of liquids, but the problem is that this liquid battery acid can be flammable and it can be corrosive, um, especially when you're trying to make really big, really powerful batteries. So that's kind of just a limitation. Uh, and polymer electrolytes are safer, but it's a lot harder to transport lithium. You can think about trying to you know, stir something in water versus stir something into cookie dough. It's, you have to, it's a lot slower basically. So my research looks at um, kind of the self-assembly that I showed on the last slide, but we make it uh, into kind of channels. So you can see um, kind of how I showed on the previous slide, the layer structure. We can do the same thing, but we can put the ions that we wanna move into the layers. So then they have a straight path right through. And so the idea is that these self-assembled shapes that we're able to control on the nanoscale might be able to help make batteries better, make them safer. Yeah. We can go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't had as many experiences as Kate, but I still do want to talk briefly about what I've enjoyed about my PhD so far. Um, I've just found the people to be really great. Um, what I've found is that if you are into science or if you think you might one day be into science, um, going into a PhD, you're surrounded by people who are just as passionate as you, just as excited to try new things as you. And it's a great sense of community and it's a great way to learn from other people. You can see this is my cohort. These are other people who are also second year students and we just really love to celebrate together. So on the left, that's us celebrating, finishing our first year and on the right, us celebrating, finishing um, our first full year. And, you know, it's, it's just nice to have people you can hang out with and then you can talk science with and it's a great community. Thank you, Maggie. Hello, uh, my name is Ben Andalia, and I am also a second year student. I'm the same year as Maggie uh, here at the University of Pennsylvania. I did my undergraduate in molecular, so really small scale engineering at the University of Chicago. This is a picture of me looking incredibly silly for Halloween uh, during my time there in undergraduate. And um, yeah, I have been, I have been a vision, I originally got into the PhD because ever since I was younger, even in my sixth grade science class, I would always like to go and bug the teacher, possibly even a bit too much on just the way that things worked uh, and had a very strong desire to just go and try to understand as much as you can. And the best advice that I ever got about this is with science, it's an amazing field because the more you understand, the more you realize you don't understand, and the more you realize there's directions to go in and things to pursue. Um, <clears throat> even now, when we have all of these things that are cons would be considered magical a hundred years ago, there are so many different directions that we could go and pursue 
uh, and explore even on the biggest scales, or in this case for today, on the smallest scales that we as humans can go and observe. Uh, next slide. So uh, if you guys could uh, imagine for me, when you guys have a glass of water and a drop of, for example, blue food coloring, the food coloring is splashed into the water and then slowly kind of randomly goes out until it's evenly spread throughout the entire glass of water. And the entire glass of water is this kind of sh uh, this uh, same homogeneous shade of blue. And this is underneath a process called diffusion, where these small particles, as uh, Kate was talking about earlier, kind of randomly move until they're all evenly spaced out. Um, this is a really useful um, <clears throat> thing to help understand for, as Ariel was talking about, for this process of characterizing materials. Because if you have materials where movement is happening inside of them, you would like to know how fast the movement is going, what directions they would go, when could you expect one drop of food coloring to completely kind of fill up and evenly spread throughout a glass of water. Um, however, doing this is a really kind of complicated process because if you look on the right on the two math equations there, those are the types of equations that you need to solve and there's way more letters than there are numbers. They're kind of ridiculous at, at this point. Um, so what we like to do is we go and try to measure the diffusion of uh, certain materials um, by allowing it to start moving a little bit. And then we cause the food coloring equivalent to stop moving after a few days and measure how much it moved over a certain period of time to help us get an insight into what the diffusion coefficient. Uh, next slide, please. And the way that we do that is using an ion beam, which uh, Kate mentioned earlier. And it's it's a really neat process where we use uh, the sputtering gun, which is effectively we have a little um, laser beam that fires out these ions, specifically known as xenon, which is the 54th element of the periodic table. We fire these little tiny atoms into the surface of what our material is. And like... Um, a cannonball hitting into the side of a pirate ship where material gets splintered off. Our material gets hit and secondary ions, ions get splintered off and kind of fly through the air. And we are working on a machine that could go and measure what the size of those ions and what the charges of those ions are that are going and flying through the air. And using that, we could determine what atoms were actually flying, which tells us the on a nanoscale, what the composition of our material is. Um, and on the right, you could see this is an actual real image from the research that we're doing. That is what happens to the material that we're using after it gets hit by this uh, ion beam, where you could see up at the top, it was nice and smooth, but right before the top on this very, very tiny microscopic scale, you could see how it's all become rough and jagged. And that's because we've launched a large amount of the material off of it to go and try and figure out what this tiny on a microscopic, not perceivable by the human eye scale, what the composition is uh, mostly made out of. Uh, next slide. And then, yeah, and I wanted to finish talking a bit about my joy with a PhD as someone who likes to go and ask questions about just kind of how the way things work. A PhD is a wonderful experience to go and help facilitate that because you're in a supportive en environment where you could go and speak to people, speak to people who are better uh, or more skilled at the material that you're working with than you are, or speak with your professor who's an expert in the field and ask them for advice on, I wanna try this experiment or I wanna try it this way and be given both the resources and the opportunity to go and pursue these different directions entirely based off of the questions that I have and the questions that I'm particularly interested in. And some of the questions are just, you get to answer them because they're fascinating. On the right-hand side, I have an image from uh, one of my collaborators that I'm working with where that is 
a nanoparticle. So one of those tiny, tiny, tiny little particles, way smaller than a human hair that uh, Kate was talking about earlier, that one of our collaborators decided to just add these long little like bottle brush things on the surface of our nanoparticle and came to us and asked, how does that change the science? And I said, I don't know, let's go and figure it out. So one of the things that I've been able to do and been able to research is uh, just by trying to figure out these interesting fundamental questions on what happens if you change this normal situation slightly? How does that go and impact the science uh, and things there? Why polymers? Um, actually, uh, when I was uh, an under undergrad, um, I was interested in um, um, like skincare and beauty products. And I know polymers um, is uh, very commonly used in that uh, it's a very common ingredient. Um, in those field. That's why, like, I would like to learn more about it. I would like to learn, like, how to uh, formulate those products. Um, that's why I picked polymers. And I entered the lab when I was undergrad as an undergrad uh, researcher, and I liked it. That's why, and um, that's why I decided to pursue PhD after undergraduation. Um, why engineering? I I like I like um playing with stuff like when I was young I like taking part, um like the alarm clocks um uh, sometimes like the lens, the phones, mm -hmm. yeah, um I like I I enjoy uh studying why things work the way they are. Um, and I think um, engineering can fulfill that kind of curiosity that I have. Um, yeah. And I like to, I would like to study something um, that's more ap application based. So like, I know I'm studying this and someday, someday it can be used. Um, it can be seen and used in real life. Ben, since you're there, and then you put yeah. Maggie in. Yeah, yeah. so to uh, help uh, discuss, at least from my personal experience, the reason why I'm interested in polymers, and I actively chose that as uh, research that I was uh, investigating, was mainly because in my undergraduate, when I was doing college, um, in one of my last years of it, I took a random class about polymers. And it was one of these kind of spur of the moment decisions. It wasn't like I've been planning it for my entire life. I was vaguely interested in the topic because so many things are made out of them. So many plastics. Um, so my clothes that I'm wearing are all made out of them. So I just wanted to learn a little bit more. And when I started learning a little bit more, I realized how awesome and how they're really everywhere. And that made me want to go and pursue it because it seemed to be like the kind of new up and coming and emerging research that I wanted to go and be involved with that I also found was personally fun to go and talk about and experiment with. For the purpose, for the reason of being an engineer, I do believe that part of it is I love Legos. Um, and I think most engineers, if you go and talk with them, will say that they love Legos. By the way, Legos are polymers. Um, and I like to go and build them. And I've always liked to go and do that. So when I wanted to both do the figuring out the way things work, but also building and designing systems, the really kind of center of that Venn diagram is this type of engineering where we're looking at the fundamental way things work on a microscopic scale, but we're also building and designing things and working with direct applications that we could go and uh, say directly affects the world. Like Kate's working on carbon capture, which is one of the most, the biggest up and coming things that the United States government is really focused on trying to fund and research. Um, 
And so it's this good, at least for me, and I, I think for my two friends here, uh, it's this good middle ground where we get to figure out a lot of the way things work and also have this direct application aspect of it. Kate or Maggie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I I have an answer to this too. Um, so for me, it goes back a lot further. So I took my first chemistry class in my first year of high school. So I was like 14 years old and um, I was in Pittsburgh. So I had a university near me. Some of you might know Carnegie Mellon University and they hosted a program to teach, you know, teenagers about material science and all the different types of engineering. And I sat in on this lecture on material science and I didn't understand much of it at all, but I kept seeing little things where I was like, oh, oh, I, I, I know this from my chemistry class. And I thought it was so interesting seeing how once you start learning anything about chemistry, you can start learning about material science and you can start seeing applications. So from there, just for the rest of my high school, I took classes about materials and about polymers. And it just kept being the more I took classes, the more I was able to see connections between those classes and materials and real life. And I thought that was so cool that I kept doing it in college. And I just I just kept going and I keep learning more about materials. And for me, it happened to be polymers just because they're all around us. And so I saw the most connections there probably. But um, yeah, I just, for me, it was keep taking classes and then keep seeing the things from those classes pop up in real life. And just my fascination in that kept me in the field and I had no reason to leave. <laughs> yeah. And engineering was kind of secondary for me um, because for materials, um, which is what I knew that I wanted to do. All of the programs that would teach me about materials happened to be engineering programs. I, I think um, my friends here have talked about polymers a lot. Um, I'll just tell you what I guess my philosophy on engineering is after a few years. And um, I think materials and spe specifically is really special because you use materials every day. One bonus of going to like Rutgers undergrad and doing like powder processing is what they call it. Um, materials engineering is you get really, really good at baking. So <laughs> everything like you use, you can use it in your everyday life. Um, you just have like this like deep, you know a little bit about everything. So like, I know what this mouse is made of. I know like how to bake well. Um, and a lot of the same science is used in baking, cooking, a lot of the toys you play with. Um, and it's all just connected. Engineering is also, um, if you are someone who likes to find something, an easier way to do something, that's the whole purpose of engineering. And I'm pretty lazy myself. So it's like, if you want to, instead of walking a mile, you're engineering like a bike and that's how you go the whole mile. And so this philosophic, like this is the concept behind engineering, which is what really makes me pursue it. You want to find easier ways for people to do things so that they can do them and have like a better life. And that's why I chose engineering. <laughs>